In his book, Consciousness and the Brain, Deciphering How the Brain Codes Our Thoughts, the French neuroscientist Stanislas Dayen introduces us to what is by now a highly influential theory of consciousness that he developed using research in cognitive psychology and neuroscience. In chapter one, he tells us a story about the history of consciousness as an object of scientific research, pointing out that throughout a large portion of the 20th century, a lot of neuroscientists were taught by the scientific community, including their mentors and their advisors, to avoid talking about consciousness because it was thought to be too speculative of an object of discussion in the natural sciences, which resulted in a very bizarre situation, namely scientists doing research on consciousness, but without talking about consciousness. He says the C word was banned for neuroscientists for most of the 20th century. He then points out that this changed in the 1990s when Crick and Watson, whom you may know on account of their discovery of the structure of uh, DNA, pointed out that it is possible to study consciousness in a laboratory setting, primarily using visual illusions. This, according to Diane, marked a turning moment in the history of neuroscience and the philosophical study of consciousness. It was the moment, he says, in which consciousness entered the laboratory. But once consciousness entered the laboratory, scientists faced a really difficult question, which was, how do we define consciousness? For his part, Diane defines consciousness as access consciousness, which refers to the moment that key information that we receive from the senses or even from inside our bodies becomes globally available to the whole brain rather than to any particular subsections of it. And we can use that information to perform important cognitive functions like uh, reporting with language, like reflecting uh, in our heads, or even like reasoning, engaging in a process of deliberation where we use one premise, another premise, another premise in order to draw a final conclusion. On Diane's theory of consciousness, our bodies are constantly being bombarded by all kinds of information coming both from within ourselves, but also from the world itself, which means two things. One, it means that there is competition between different sources of information as our brains have to decide what information is important enough in order to deal with in the moment and what information is not important enough and therefore can fall by the wayside. Secondarily, it means that there is always a bottleneck effect as our experience is constituted only by the information that passes through a relatively narrow channel that differentiates the information that is available to our bodies and to our sensory organs from the information that actually makes it into our conscious awareness. This understanding of consciousness leads Diane to differentiate consciousness proper from three other concepts with which, he says, it is typically but erroneously conflated. The first of these concepts is attention. He argues that although we can attend to a lot of things because our senses can pick up a lot of information, we are not necessarily conscious of everything that our bodies pay attention to. Thus, we must be able to differentiate between consciousness and attention. The second concept from which we must disambiguate consciousness is wakefulness. Although typically wakefulness and consciousness go hand in hand because most of the time when we are awake, and alert and vigilant, we are also consciously aware of our environment, like presumably I am right now, Diane points out that there are moments when we are fully awake, alert, and vigilant, but are not consciously aware of our surroundings. So think about cases of zoning out, when you just sort of zone out for a second and you forget where you are, but you're not actually asleep and you're not really unconscious. A good example of this, arguably, is when you're driving for a very long period of time, like when you're going on a road trip and after 20, 15, maybe even 10 minutes of driving on a long, monotonous, linear road, you realize, hmm, I think I just zoned out and I don't remember the last 10, 15, 20 minutes. Those moments of remaining vigilant and awake, but not really being conscious of what just happened, Diane says, must lead us to differentiate consciousness from wakefulness. The third and final distinction is between consciousness and what is known as phenomenality, 
Phenomenality is a very difficult concept to describe, but for our purposes, let's just define it as a qualitative feeling of something at the moment that it takes place. I'll give two examples. When I run and I suddenly sprain my ankle, I feel an intensity in my foot that is very difficult to describe objectively and that I can't really describe in quantitative language. And that feeling, that intensity, that raw sensation of hurting is what some philosophers and neuroscientists call a phenomenal feeling or a phenomenal experience. Another example of phenomenality is my experience of colors. So when I look at a painting and I see red, I just see the red, but I would have a very difficult time explaining what red is to somebody who, for whatever reason, has never seen the color red. That feeling, that lift experience, that what it is like of the thing, that phenomenal quality, he says, is not to be confused with consciousness proper because consciousness proper on the ENS model is about information that, again, is globally available to the brain, information that we can manipulate to think, to reflect, and ultimately to create linguistic reports that we share with other members of our linguistic community. So at the end of this account, what we get is a theory of consciousness in which consciousness means specifically access consciousness. Consciousness of information that is globally available to the brain and that facilitates reflection, cognition, and language. Now, throughout this book, Dain will make the argument that once we think about consciousness in this very narrow, specific way, we come to the conclusion that consciousness can be studied empirically in the laboratory using various methods. The four most important methods that he says we should use and that he himself has used in his laboratory in France are the following. The first of these is what he calls minimal contrast, which refers to those moments when information goes from being unconscious or pre-conscious to suddenly being conscious in the life of the subject or vice versa when information that was once conscious suddenly gets repressed into the unconscious. And Dayan says if we look at those moments in which information moves above or below the line of consciousness, we can learn something about the mechanics of conscious awareness. A second method we can use is binocular rivalry, which is a research paradigm that involves presenting different images to the eyes. So you put an image to one eye and a very different image to the other eye, so that one eye only has access to the image that is in front of it. So for example, you might show my right eye a house and my left eye a dog or a bicycle or something completely unconnected. Now, what happens when the eyes are presented with different images? You might expect that the brain might simply synthesize two images and create some kind of blending of the two at the level of conscious perception. But we now know that that's actually not what happens. Instead of merging, the images presented to the eyes begin competing for access into our conscious awareness and our perception becomes unstable. So for example, if I'm presented a house and a face, at one particular moment, I might see just a house. And then a few seconds later, my perception will change and I will see only a face even though the stimuli itself has not been changed. Now, by looking at the ways in which consciousness changes, even when the source of the information remains stable, we can again get a glimpse into how it is that our brain codes our conscious thoughts. A third method for studying consciousness in a laboratory are attention lapses. And there are three examples of this. One of them is attentional blinking which happens when you are looking for a particular thing. So let's say that I give you a task. You're going to look at a series of letters, and then the moment that you see an uppercase, you're going to press a button. Research shows that when you're looking for that uppercase, all your attentional resources are devoted to figuring out at which moment it's going to come up. Then when the uppercase letter finally shows up and you press the button, it's almost as if you're so excited and so much attention has gone into this particular task that after you discover the uppercase letter, there is a moment in time when your attention actually blinks, just like your eyes might blink, and you become unaware of whatever happens immediately after the presentation of the uppercase letter.
And so those moments of attentional blinking tell us something about consciousness itself, namely that consciousness is not a stream that is smooth, but it's actually punctuated by moments of absences. A second example of attentional lapses is what researchers called inattentional blindness. Now, inattentional blindness occurs when you're so immersed in a particular task that you actually miss completely obvious things that we think you should miss in your environment. So for example, think about when you're so intently playing a game of chess that you don't notice that, I don't know, the sink in the kitchen is flooding the floor and your feet are wet just because you're so fully committed to the task in front of you that you become inattentive to the rest of your environment. A third example of an attentional lapse is change blindness. Now we know that people are extremely bad at tracking changes in their perceptual field, largely because attention sometimes goes on holidays. And by tapping into those moments when our attention either gets distracted or blinks, we can make major changes to somebody's immediate surroundings without them even realizing that a thing has been changed. Finally, a fourth example of the kind of research that we can do in the lab is masking. In the laboratory, researchers now can render particular stimuli entirely invisible to the research subjects they are studying simply by manipulating the parameters of their conscious perception. So you might think here, for example, about the possibility of subliminal messages. We know that if you present somebody with an image, for less than 40 milliseconds, their brains will register the information. They will see it and it might even affect their behavior, especially over a certain period of time. But if you ask them if they saw an image, people will simply deny it. They will say, I didn't see anything. So these cases of masking when information that is presented to the senses is hidden from conscious awareness also tell us something about the relationship between the conscious and the unconscious aspects of our minds. So what conclusions should we draw from all of this? Diane draws two methodological conclusions. The first one is that consciousness is indeed a respectable object of scientific investigation that psychologists, neuroscientists, and philosophers need to pay close attention to. The second one is that we need to recognize the primacy of subjective experience. Even if we don't always accept introspection as a method of doing science, we should accept introspection as a source of legitimate data for scientific research. Meaning that even if scientists don't publish articles or write books based on their own introspection of their own feelings, they should look at the way in which research subjects introspect and the reports that follow from that introspection and treat them as raw data for experiments. Because those reports tell us something about the way in which the brain is indeed coding our conscious thoughts.